So good evening. Um, you may or may not recall that the Thetford Historical Society traditionally had the, a spring speaker series and we had some sort of a global pandemic um, which uh, put this uh, on the shelf. But now we're back and um, thank you for coming. This is... <laughs> Uh, this is the first of five lectures that will happen every Thursday night, um, and they're going to happen in different places. So next Thursday at the NEFOC Center, which is the former North Thetford Church, um, Kevin Gardner is going to talk about stone walls, and he's actually going to create a stone wall while he does his presentation, which is pretty cool. Um, the following Thursday on, at, at the First Congregational Church on the Hill, um, Tim Jennings, who's a wonderful traditional uh, Vermont storyteller, will um, tell us compelling stories of um, oral tradition from Vermont. Uh, then on the last Thursday in April, Thursday the 27th, um, Marty Podscotch will talk about the history of the Civilian Con Conservation Corps in Vermont, and there will be a Thetford uh, focus on that because there were, were camps here in Thetford. And then finally on, and that's, did I say where that is? You'll, you'll be hearing more about it. That's at the Thetford Center Community Building. And then the last one, May 4th, um, again back at the old uh, North Thetford Church, um, Murder in the Vermont Woods, which will be a chat by Jill Mudgett, a story about race, class, and gender in the 19th century. A uh, couple of other um, notes. You will at some point get on your lap a sheet of paper where you can sign up to be on the Thetford Historical Society mailing list. And there, if you're interested in volunteering, there are volunteer opportunities out where the, the food is. Um, that said, although he is a rabid New York Yankees fan, we thought we'd invite Ted here for our first one. <laughs> um, and in fairness, Ted did live in Thetford for 30 years, so we'll, we'll, we'll let that pass. Um, Ted's syndicated column naturally appeared in the Valley News for 11 years, and for 24 years, he was a regular contributor to Vermont Public. Uh, his writings have appeared in numerous periodicals, including Audubon, Sierra, Sports Illustrated, National Ge Geographic, Traveler, The New York Times, The Boston Globe, Newsday, The Guardian, and The Daily Telegraph. He, his books include Backtracking, The Way of a Naturalist, Blood Brook, A Naturalist's Home Ground, and Liquid Land, A Journey Through the Florida Everglades. That latter won a Burroughs Medal in 2004, which is the highest literary honor awarded to an American nature writer. And E.O. Wilson called American Snake, which is Ted's most recent book, quote, beautifully written, demonstrating just how good nature literature can be. Um, unfortunately, Ted no longer lives in Thetford. He's moved a little further south, um, but it's a real pleasure to see him back here and to have him kick off the series. So I commend to you, Ted Levin. Uh, thank you guys very much. Well, it's, great to, it's great to be back home in Thetford. Um, I've been away two years. And it's a little bit warmer where I live now, 20 miles further south. Uh, I'm supposed to be talking about it. So Charlie sent me an email this morning. And it's supposed to be the Ice Age to present. Of course, the last three days, I've been thinking about the Ice Age and not a whole lot about the present. Uh, but I will start out with a little anecdote. About 30 years ago, I had an assignment to do a story on uh, Florida panthers. And at the time, there was about 100 Florida panthers in uh, southern Florida. And we were flying in a twin engine plane with radio equipment, trying to get the beep, beep, beeps of the panthers as they were moving around uh, the sawgrass and, and the cypress swamps. And one day, we went out in a uh, swamp buggy, and we had a male and a female underneath a uh, saw palmetto, which is a probably hip-sized palm tree. And we couldn't see them, but we got the beep, beep, beeping, and we knew that they were about 40 feet away from us. And we watched a hairy woodpecker land on a trunk of a slash pine and stare down, and we knew he was looking at them. Uh, and the point is, there is 150 panthers or catamounts, or mountain lions, whatever you choose to call them, in Florida, and nobody sees them. 
There are none in Vermont, and everybody sees them. <laughs> I went online uh, this morning, and I'll just read you a, a couple of, of samples from a website uh, for Vermont panther sightings. In 1955, I was living in Grand Isle, Vermont, and was chased by a mountain lion while riding my bicycle on the street we lived on. We was scared to death, and my elderly neighbor witnessed the whole thing. I tried to tell our neighbor about it, because she had little kids playing in the yard at the time, she laughed. So why bother to inform anyone else? They are real. They may not be around, they may not be many around, but they are real. My mom's neighbor in South Hero, Vermont, had one show up in his yard a few times also. Country folks know what a mountain lion is, they know what they see. The last known mountain lion in Vermont was shot and barnered on Thanksgiving morning, 1881, by a man named Alexander Crowell. There has never been a definitive mountain lion seen in Vermont since then, dead or alive. Um, and you go online, there are hundreds of little notes like that. So now that I got the present out of the way, we'll go back to the Ice Age. <laughs> uh, you probably all know that, that where we're assembled right now was under more than um, 5,000 feet of ice for four different periods during the Pleistocene Ice Age, four different pulses of glaciation. So what's fascinating to me is to try to think about what was here after the last um, glacier uh, slowly receded. And having visited the Arctic on numerous occasions, uh, I can um, extrapolate what I saw and where I saw it and imagine that this was the tundra. I mean, all those Arctic nesting shorebirds had to go somewhere. They just didn't disappear and then suddenly come back. Things were pushed further and further south. So when the ice left Vermont about 14,000 years ago for Thetford, uh, the first landscape we had that wasn't raw barren rock uh, and um, melting icebergs or blocks from the glacier would have been sedges and grasses in what we would consider a uh, modern day tundra in northern Quebec. And who lives in northern Quebec? Uh, many of the shorebirds that are passing up both sides of the Connecticut River today there are nine, 10, 11 species of birds that <clears throat> nest in the Eastern Arctic that are non-migratory. They had to be here. I mean, there's no physical evidence that they were here, but they had to be somewhere, and this was the tundra once upon a time. And among those birds are jeer falcons, snowy owls. They do erupt from time to time, but they're non-migratory. Red starts. Ross's gulls, ivory gulls, guillemots, thick-billed murres, dovekeys. So these are really total Arctic birds. They had to be somewhere. And once upon a time, northern New England, even southern New England, was the tundra. And the tundra continually moved farther and farther uh, north as the climate warmed. If you climb to the top of Mount Washington, you would see seven and a half miles of montane tundra. And among the plants there, diapensia, moss campion, um, arctic uh, bluets, these are plants that you'll find 800 miles further north. My guess is they had to live in Thetford once upon a time, because when Thetford was tundra, the top of Mount Washington was still ice covered as is Tuckerman's Ravine well into um, the month of June. We had um, a suite of mammals here. Uh, Vermont is not extremely conducive for the formation of mammal fossils. We have very little um, sediments. The best places for sediments would either be the Connecticut River, the Connecticut River Valley, Lake Champlain, 
or um, the uh, Vermont Valley be on the west side of the Green Mountains. But um, mastodons and mammoths have been found in western Vermont. A beluga whale fossil was found in the muck in Lake Champlain in the 1840s. So what does that tell you about Lake Champlain? It was part of the North Atlantic for um, several thousand years. When the ice was on top of Vermont, and you could read Thetford every time I say Vermont, it pushed the land down. You know, we live on the crust of the earth, and the crust of the earth floats on uh, the liquid mantle with a mile of ice pushing down the crust, it's going to sink, just like if you put your finger on an ice cube in a glass of water. And it takes a while for it to rebound. It's just not going to pop up again like a bathtub toy. It's going to take thousands of years. So with the, the level, the ocean level of Vermont, the sea level of Vermont pushed farther and farther down, the North Atlantic came in through the St. Lawrence Seaway, flooded Lake Champlain and what was called uh, Vermont Lake, and filled up a great saltwater basin. Uh, that's where the beluga whale came in. And we still have ling cod in Lake Champlain. There's landlocked alamic salmon. They all came in at that point. On this side of the state, it was quite a bit different. Um, the Connecticut River's history is one of river, lake, river, lake, river. Twice in the last 15,000 years, ice and earth formed a big dam and backed the Connecticut River up. Um, for 4,700 years, Lake Hitchcock, which started in um, Middletown, Connecticut, near Glastonbury, and backed all the way up near Burke, Vermont, was a lake. And it was a very narrow lake, maybe 10, 15 miles wide in the Pioneer Valley of Massachusetts, and uh, a mile or two wide in Vermont and New Hampshire. And it kind of looked, if you looked at a, a surficial geologic map of, of uh, Vermont and New Hampshire, it would literally look like a squash centipede, because it would go up the uh, Ompompanoosic River Valley, it would have gone, the lake would have gone up um, the White River Valley, the Mascoma, uh, and all the way up and down uh, what we know as the uh, middle part of the Connecticut River. It was about um, 90 feet higher the water level than it is today. So you can find evidence of lake bottom debris 90 feet from the current level of the Connecticut River. And one of the places you can see that is in St. Gordon's National Historic Site. You can see it at the golf course in Windsor because there are terraces that come down. And the upper terrace was from Lake Hitchcock. The lower terrace was from a lake that formed and only lasted about 600 years. It formed about 1,000 years after the breach in the dam for Lake Hitchcock, and that's Lake Upham. And that was from Turner's Falls, Massachusetts, uh, probably to Haverhill. That had a much shorter lifespan, but it left its footprint in sediments um, in the Connecticut River. Thetford has, I think, one of the most unique uh, remnants of, of Ice Age uh, geologic history in Charles Pond. You all know where that is in East Thetford? Charles Pond was never connected to uh, the Connecticut River. It was formed from a block of ice, a kettle hole, and for that reason it never had fish. So it developed a suite of aquatic insects that you can't find in any other body of water in the vicinity that has a uh, connection through streams uh, to the Connecticut. And sadly, about eight or 10 years ago, uh, somebody released a bait bucket in Charles Pond, and it's changing the whole um, insect, aquatic insect uh, fauna regime. So who else might have been uh, marching around, around Thetford? 
I am quite positive we had woolly mammoths. They are grazers. I'm quite positive that we had uh, American mastodons. They were browsers. If you looked at the teeth, the teeth of a um, woolly mammoth look very much like the teeth of a cow or the teeth of a meadow vole. It's got these ridges that are very tough enamel for uh, grinding up uh, and, and splintering the cellulose and the silica in the cellulose in grasses. Uh, mastodons were browsers, and they pull down branches from trees, and they have big rising cuffs. Uh, they look more like the teeth of moose or deer. And they were here, and my guess is they would have come in after the mastodons, because the, the, the mastodons would have come in after the mammoths, because the mammoths would have left uh, as the Arctic tundra began to disappear. Two animals I was really curious about that I couldn't document made it this far east, but possibly did, uh, was ground sloths. I found them in Ohio, and dire wolves. And dire wolves are more than pets from the Game of Thrones. They actually were a large um, colonial mammal, uh, not closely related to wolves, more closely related to jackals, and about 50% bigger than timber wolves. Uh, if they weren't here, they were awfully close because they preyed on Ice Age mammals. We had uh, caribou. Caribou were here for thousands of years. As a matter of fact, the last herd of caribou was seen at the third Connecticut lake in 1905. And they were migratory. But caribou probably 500 years ago were year round in the upper elevations of the White Mountains and the Green Mountains, as long as there was tundra for them to graze. The closest area that woodland caribou live to Vermont now is the Shikshak Mountains in the Gaspé Peninsula, um, north and east of Quebec City. And they are there, but they're disappearing there because it's getting warmer. We had a lot of moose. Moose disappeared. And when I first uh, moved to northern New England in the middle 1970s, Vermont had no moose. And New Hampshire had about 100 up and around the Androscoggin River and Lake Umbagog. And they have both made an incredible comeback, and they are both um, slowly withdrawing again because uh, conditions for them are not nearly as favorable as they were 30 years ago. Uh, shorter winters, uh, more winter ticks surviving. Uh, White-tailed deer were probably a marginal animal at best right after the Ice Age, if they were here at all. They probably moved in after things got a lot warmer. And I'm going to stop now and, and tell you about a book that I think has a bearing not only on the Ice Age, but on uh, every aspect of understanding the nature of the planet we live on. In 1989, a hero of mine, Stephen Jay Gould, wrote a book called The Burgess Shale. And about the Burgess Shale, it was called A Wonderful Life. And it's the Burgess Shale in natural history. And for those of you that don't know about the Burgess Shale, it's a great shale um, ledge in uh, western British Columbia in the in Canadian Rockies. And it's the um, heart and soul of pre-Cambrian invertebrate fossils, which is to say it is littered with fossils more than 500 million years old. And Gould wrote a book about this. And one of the things he, he pointed out that I never forgot is something he called contingencies, events that you can see, but you cannot predict the way it's going to be in the future. And as he was, was translating all these fossils in the Burgess Shale, he spoke about one pretty obscure fossil that was dwarfed in number and dwarfed in size by hundreds of other fossils. And this was a forerunner that led to chordates and eventually led to people. And there was no way that you could look at the these, these shale ledge and look at these fossils and point your finger at this and say, 500 million years from now, the leading life form on this planet is going to evolve from this. 
Um, which is to say, we have no idea what's going to happen in the future. But it's fun to speculate. So I told you about the catamount. Uh, we also had wolverines in Vermont. And the last wolverines disappeared, the best I could tell, in the 1840s in the Green Mountains. In 1922, the last wolverines east of Minnesota, two little babies, were found in a den on the west bank of the Androscoggin River in Coast County, New Hampshire. So it wasn't all that long ago, about a century ago, they were still uh, in northern New England. There are none in Maine. We had lynx. And miraculously, people are sighting lynx again. I've seen them on game, ca game cameras in 2015, 2018, both in southern Vermont and in the Northeast Kingdom. But after the Ice Age, uh, there was probably a lot of lynx uh, hunting uh, the barren grounds and, and the boreal forests that were slowly moving in. So the landscape we know in Vermont now where would it have gone with a mile of ice here? Sea levels were 300 feet lower than they are today, which meant dry land went all the way out to the edge of the continental shelf. And an animal that's quite dear to my heart that lives in, used to live in Fairley, probably crawled around North Thetford on more than a single occasion, timber rattlesnake survived 300 miles off the coast of North and South Carolina um, on dry land. There was a period about, starting about 9,000 years ago, called the Hypsothermal Interval. And it was a warm trend that began and lasted for about 4,000 years. And Vermont back then, Thetford back then, would have been very much like modern day Virginia. Color would have been duller. Maple sap wouldn't have run as long and run a lot earlier. Not unlike it's running now, really. Um, but there are things living in Thetford, living in Vermont, and living in New Hampshire that gained their foothold in the state because of the hypsothermal interval and that warming trend. And on the west side of the state, would be uh, five-lined skinks, the only lizard in Vermont, and black rat snakes. On the east side of the state, uh, we had timber rattlesnakes, and they were here uh, up until the 1890s in the Fairley Cliffs, up until the 1950s in Cottonstone Mountain in Orford. And though I have never seen any indication that there was a denning site in Thetford, I do know males move up to four miles uh, in the summer looking for mates. And I would think four miles from the Fairley Cliffs might bring you into North Thetford, or certainly Ely. All of the orchids in Vermont came up during the hypsothermal, all of the insectivorous plants. Uh, we have trees like white oak and red oak on this side of the state, post oak and chestnut oak on the western side of the state. They came up during the hypsothermal. American chestnut came here, sycamores. Uh, Bitternut hickory, shagbark hickory. So <clears throat> every plant and every animal that you look at in town has its own personal history as to how it got here and when it got here after the Ice Age. And some came at different periods of times over the last uh, five or 6,000 years. And one of, one of the things that, that um, fascinates me so much about the Ice Age is that it was nothing but change. And that same change is happening now, except in a human lifetime, it's very, very hard to um, parcel it out. We do know that climate change is happening. I told you the hypsothermal lasted for thousands of years. But our climate change is happening a lot quicker than the hypsothermal. And if you were to start picking on what plants and what animals may benefit from climate change, what plants and may animal, animals may um, lose out to climate change. 
uh, you can have really uh, good educated guesses. The top of Mount Washington, the top of Mount um, Adams, the top of Camel's Hump, the top of Mount Mansfield is populated with disjunct Arctic tundra. I bet it'll all be gone. Um, it can't have I me. Mean, it's been shrinking for the last 5,000 years. It's going to shrink that much more. You all know about Bicknell's thrush? It's a, an endemic thrush to high elevation forests from the Catskill Mountains, uh, I believe, into Newfoundland. And Bicknell's thrush is currently losing ground uh, because Swainson's thrushes and hermit thrushes are going higher and higher up the elevation. And I believe right now in the Catskills, Bicknell's thrush is endangered um, from completely blinking out. We have a suite of boreal birds in the Northeast Kingdom, spruce grouse, um, gray jays, arctic woodpeckers, blackback woodpeckers. They are holdovers. They were probably in Thetford maybe seven or 8,000 years ago. Now they're isolated into the Northeast Kingdom. Boreal chickadees is another one. They will likely withdraw into, into um, Quebec, and they'll follow their habitat north, and they'll be outcompeted by uh, chickadees and titmice and the various things that'll keep moving further and further north. Audubon Magazine has a, a, a website that you can type in a bird species in the Northeast or anywhere, and you could look at its current distribution. You could look at its distribution if the average global temperature increases one to two degrees centigrade, or if it increases three to four degrees centigrade. And there's clearly a northward push um, as things dry out and, and, and uh, warm up. And that's why I think we may live to see moose disappear from uh, at least, maybe not from northern Maine, but northern Vermont and northern New Hampshire. And there's not a whole lot you can do about it because the climate's changing. So there are a couple other um, aspects of, of the Ice Age that I think uh, might be fun to share with you. I mean, we've all been to Lake Fairley. And Lake Fairley has a really interesting um, history. It is in the footprint of an extinct river called the Ely River that was here uh, even before the Ice Age. And you know, if you take Route 244 around Lake Fairley and you're coming down to Route 5, you're in a gap. Clearly, it's a gap, and that gap was ground out and eroded away by the uh, extinct Ely River. And there is a delta where the Ely River opened up into what is now the Connecticut River. Um, and you can see cows on that delta. No water flows there anymore. But Lake Fairley sits in the footprint, a small part of that footprint. And it's because when the glaciers were melting, just like the Connecticut River got plugged up with earth and ice and debris, the um, edge of Lake Fairley got plugged up, and Middlebrook and Bloodbrook flowing into it over the centuries filled up the basin, as well as, as rain and snow melt. So virtually every place you can look in town, um, if you knew, you know, if I knew more about geology, I could pick out a few other places, I am sure. But everywhere, whether you're looking at an animal or a plant, or you're looking at a geologic, physiographic feature, it has its own history. And it has its own future. We just don't happen to know what it is yet. Um, I would like to uh, read to you from something I wrote about 30 years ago. I lived for about seven years on Bloodbrook Road in uh, West Fairley, on the northwest end of, above the northwest end of Lake Fairley. So I decided, um, I did a book about living there and tried to find out everything I could about the lake and the things that lived around the lake. 
And um, I wrote a chapter called Remembering the Ice Age. To see the tracks of the Ice Age, both actual and imagined, to sense Bloodbrook and Lake Failure's past converging on the present, I joined the Ravens, which may or, not, may or may not contemplate such things, high above Bloodbrook Valley. I'm sitting in the front seat of a two-person glider, the pilot behind me, floating 4,000 feet above the north end of the lake. We drift with the wind, rising and sinking gently and quietly, circling alone on the currents, sailboating in the sky. Bloodbrook Valley lengthens below me, green and rumpled, a wilderness to be indulged, contemplated, savored. At its mouth, Bloodbrook splinters into innumerable channels, which saturate an older cattail marsh and then merge into a slightly deeper lily-filled cove. Bloodbrook's ramiform mouth emulates its headwaters where, on the west side of Spalding Hill, more than a dozen seeps and springs coalesce into the brook. Just beyond the northeast corner of the lake, a 700-foot gully cleaves the green sloping hills. From a raven's perspective, this is a prominent geologic feature. A great chop in a mound of living earth, which I somehow miss while standing on firm ground. According to Vermont geologists, this gap was cut more than two million years ago by the late Ely River, an extinct pre-Ice Age tributary of the Connecticut. It is the only large notch I can see between the Waits River and the Ompompanoosic. I imagine a turbulent, trout-filled Ely River gouging, carving, pulverizing bedrock as it forms the future of Lake Fairley's basin, as it takes the waters of Bloodbrook and Middlebrook east <coughs> along what is now an asphalt line, Route 244. In that epic, hills thrust up, raw and jagged, unplaned by glaciers. On an imagined topographic map of the Pleistocene epic geologic survey, which I'll call the Ely Quadrangle, of 2.5 million years ago, the packed contour lines of Spalding Hill and Baltop show a steeper rise than they do today, perhaps a thousand feet above Blood Brook, which is visible only as a skinny blue line. Such a map might bear a strong resemblance to the likeness of the Idaho Rockies. From my vantage point, just beneath the clouds, I see the fossil course of Blood Brook, south down Bloodbrook Road, east on 244, around the north end of Lake Fairley, through the Ely River Pass, now home to vehicles instead of purling water, then south along Route 5, down the Connecticut, where cows graze in the ancient delta. Before the first of four waves of Pleistocene glaciers bulldozed Bloodbrook Valley, a lower branch of the Ompompanoosic turned north and hijacked the Ely River near Post Mills. Redirected its flow westward, eventually joining the Connecticut at about 10 miles south of the Ely's former delta. Bloodbrook and Middlebrook, with the Ely River, then emptied to the south. Gradually, the old drainage route lapsed and the Ely River Pass became dry, a victim of restless, unsettled topography. About 14,000 years ago, the retreating glacier left a stagnant block of ice in the Ely River Valley. Sand and gravel washed in, piled up 80 feet deep against the southwest edge of the rotten ice, and held the waters back to form the classic Kettle Hole Lake, Lake Fairley. Incarcerated in the footprint of an ancient flowage, the sum of ice, landscape, and fate. Looking across the watershed, I imagine a time about a 1,000 years later, after Lake Fairley first appeared, when ice and glacial debris blocked the flow of the Connecticut River near Middletown, Connecticut, about 150 miles below Lake Fairley. The big river backed up to Burke, Vermont, flooding its own valley and the 
connected lowlands, including the Ely River Pass, Lake Fairley, and halfway up Bloodbrook and Middlebrook. The river system was transformed into a giant lake. Its chemistry, biology, and shoreline changed from that of a swift to standing water. Even the principal species of aquatic insects must have shifted with the new regime, called Lake Hitchcock. The ephemeral glacial lake resembled a squashed yellow centipede on the superficial map of Vermont, its appendages reaching into our own modern valleys. Gliding on in our airborne boat, we see a run of round green domes southeast of Lake Fairley, Potato Hill, Ely Mountain, Houghton Hill. From my kitchen window on cool mornings last June, I watched the mist rise off the lake and fill the valley, much as Lake Hitchcock might have done. And suddenly I realized the tops of familiar local hills must have once been islands in that glacial lake. As they emerged from the mist, I saw the specters of mammoths and mastodons stalked by both Paleolithic hunters and by an unknown, unforgiving future. The geologic metamorphosis was temporary. The earth and the ice dam broke, valley drained, rivers and brooks thinned, islands became hilltops again, shallow ponds dried to meadows, Freed up northern New England waters must have poured into Long Island Sound with unimaginable force. Then, a second dam at Turner's Falls, Massachusetts, backed up water to create Lake Upham. Finally, about 10,000 years ago, when the dam ruptured and Lake Upham discharged its holdings, the Connecticut River flowed freely and modern Lake Fairley emerged. Still tied to the hills, by concentric streams, a great blue basin in an otherwise greening valley. Silt and clay from the bottom of Lake Hitchcock and sand and gravel from its old shores, freshly exposed and glacially minted, would have supported the first tundra and the first boreal forest. Catching a tongue of air, deflating off ball top, spiraling higher into the firmament, the glider carries us beyond Lake Fairley, across Route 244. A turkey vulture passes below, wings cocked obliquely, rocking like a toy kite. I see Bloodbrook Valley, broadly U-shaped, a wall of brown sand, perhaps a remnant of a prehistoric beach, stands above a pasture, a vestige of Lake Hitchcock. The sand hosts nesting turtles, on dark nights in June, painted turtles excavate in the open sand along the flank of the, of the wall. By dawn, snapping turtles, even more prehistoric than the old beach, dig in the sparsely vegetated flats that run south toward the road. From 3,000 feet, I see Blood Brook descend through the glacially widened valleys, twice swelling into a series of beaver ponds one near the brook's lower end, the other more than a mile to the north. White, barkless sticks on the lodge of the lower beaver pond glint in the sun. Recent ancestors of these beavers probably dispersed upstream from the lake as generations have done since the withdrawal of the last glacier. I, I may stop here for a moment. Somebody had mentioned a giant beaver uh, in the northeast. They were here, but they were not dam builders and they were not lodge builders. They functioned more like muskrats. They were semi-aquatic. Uh, they had really big teeth, you know, um, the size of bananas or bigger, but they did not cut down trees. They fed on soft vegetation. The lodge and the upper beaver ponds, probably descendants of the lower pond family, is screened in a mesh of shrubs even when I stand at the edge of the pond, I cannot always see the lodge, but I've seen freshly cut aspens and alders and an elderly, fully flowered apple. Last April, a pair swam upstream, entered our pond, and stayed for a few days, cavorting in full view of Linny and Casey, who picnicked on the shoreline. By the time I came home from California, they were gone. 
They left behind a flotilla of debarked aspen branches and a crude stick dome lodge with they, which they visited for several days, several weeks later. From the air, it's possible to look across Spalding Hill to the northeast. I see the white mountains, their peaks still white with June snow. To the northwest, Mount Mansfield capped by a bit of Arctic tundra. Looking south, I see Bloodbrook's waters merge with a flow from a dozen other valleys to feed the east branch of the Ompompanoosic. Then the Connecticut before coursing on to the sea. I see a great green sprawl, dendritic drainages from valley to valley to horizon, a three-dimensional map. Land is a manifestation of memory. As the climate grew warmer, Bloodbrook's tundra was gradually replaced by spruce. Fir and larch, whose descendants still cast pollen from the edge of nearby peatlands, themselves remnants of Ice Age lakes that slowly filled with sediment. Peatlands are a type of wetland that abounded in the accumulated organic soil. In them, deposition exceeds decomposition. Like Mount Washington's Alpine Gardens, peatlands are reminders of a boreal past and kin to the present day Canadian North, seemingly out of place in an otherwise summer green woods. Sequestered in cold pockets, bound by an evergreen noose that is slowly closing, the peatlands, bogs, fens, and cedar swamps are ephemeral. One Memorial Day, I visited a northern white cedar swamp an hour's drive from Thetford. I saw the sun while driving, but by the time I reached Barnet, it hid behind mounds of clouds which fell away one behind the other like a fading roll of hills. I parked and entered the woods. The cool air smelled like a cedar chest. A Canada warbler flitted through the deep conifer shade on a mulch of hammock, I soon found Calypso, one of the rarest and most beautiful orchids in northern New England, and the reason for the trip. Gently, I fingered the flower, two lateral petals and three sepals, with five tapering magenta fingers radiated from the cap of an inflated, slipper-shaped orchid. The top of the lip, white and yellow dotted, with purple spread into an apron that curled at the edges and was cleft at the tip. Brown purple lines streaked the arrow like down the slipper's side, pointing toward a prominent tuft of yellow hairs at the base of the apron. An unsuspecting bumblebee would enter, mistake the hairs for pollen, and after a futile attempt to collect them, would force her way into the slipper in search of food Instead of nectar, two sticky pollen balls would be firmly glued to her head. If Calypso is to be pollinated, the bee must re repeat her mistake. Look for pollen grains in another flower, and then finding none, she must enter the flower where the viscous surface, surface of the pistil, or stigma, scrapes the pollen from her head, fertilizing the orchid. Once bumblebees learn that Calypso offers no edible pollen or nectar, they stop returning. Which is to say, this elfin orchid on a recently, depends on a recently metamorphosed and totally inexperienced bumblebees, the naive bees of spring, to complete its reproductive cycle. Pollinated, the sepals and petals brown and fall, and the inferior ovary enclosed at the base of the lip produces a crop of dust-like seeds. Each seed contains only enough food to start germination. In order to grow, the seed must come in contact with specific soil fungus that will supply nutrients to the developing embryo. Without the fungus, the embryo dies. Shy, beautiful as the sea nymphs in Homer's Odyssey, Calypso gambles against long odds, casting hundreds of thousands of seeds across the cedar glade. Very few germinate, very few still survive. For Calypso grows in only four locations. It's a messenger from another age. 
Uh, and I could tell you now that it no longer grows in that um, cedar swamp. Um, it's probably gone from Vermont now. Ice Age mammals fire my imagination. Shaggy scotch, highland cattle, and woolly winter horses look like they had just stepped off the wall of a cave painting. They evoke images of the Pleistocene, bands of mammoths and mastodons, tusks and trunks and floppy ears ranging across a northern landscape. This is Blood Brook, perhaps 10,000 years ago when the tundra reached down from the green mountains to the edge of the emerging spruce woods. In 1848, railroad construction workers unearthed a pile of large fossil bones in Mount Holly. Renowned Harvard zoologist and geologist Louis Agassiz identified them as belonging to a woolly mammoth. The Ice Age elephant whose remains are more often associated with Siberia and Alaska. This discovery suggests that Vermont was once bleak and windy. An Arctic outpost peopled by wandering nomads whose roving herds of Ice Age mammals north as a glacier waned. More information has been gathered about woolly mammoths than any other extinct species. Fossil ivory hunters who comb the subarctic for the curved mammoth tusks have ex excavated entire frozen carcasses in the permafrost, and dissection has shed light on the animal's seasonal diets. Grasses, sedges, poppies, ferns in summer, willow, birch, and larch in winter. One intact mammoth discovered in Siberia at the end of the 19th century had died so suddenly in a, geologic, in a glacial crevice that it held 24 pounds of food in its mouth and much more in its stomach. As days grew colder and shorter, woolly mammoths began to store enormous amounts of fat to buffer it against the Arctic winter. Sinuses in the top of the head on either side of the large ridge, pinched up bone called the sagittal crest, filled with fat, hence the massive cranial knob. Beyond its neck, another huge mound of seasonal fat developed, much like a camel's hump. The mound and the knob of fat were hedges against diminished food resources. By the time spring arrived, the grazing was again profitable. A woolly mammoth had metabolized almost its entire store of fat. American mastodons, which browsed Bloodbrook's conifers about the same time woolly mammoths grazed its tundra, left more fossil bones than any other creature that ever lived. Buried remains have been recovered in bogs, preserved in acid waters, one mastodon had five bushels of conifer twigs packed inside its ribcage. And numerous others were found with food impacted molars that showed signs of a preference for spruce and hemlock needles, trees which still grow on Spalding Hill. Some mastodons had pine pitch jammed between their cusps of their molars. It's no wonder that paleontologists suggest tooth decay and pyorrhea were common. Brittle, broken mastodon tusks dug up from clay deposits disintegrate in the air. Those preserved in bogs reveal the mastodons were either right or left tusks. When a pair of long straight tusks were found together, one is invariably shorter than the other, which suggests these animals used to one tusk to the exclusion of the other. Woolly mammoth tusks, which grew out and up and curled back in to plow snow from the surface of the ground, show no signs of preferences of being left or right tusks. Even the social structure of these animals can be deduced from the fossil record, which helps us visualize a creature that was more, more than simply an eating machine. I recently visited the mammoth site of Hot Springs, South Dakota, where the remains of more than 300 Colombian mammoths, a close Ice Age relative of the woolly mammoth, have been found. 
After slacking their thirst in a prairie sinkhole, the animals either drowned or starved when the sides of the basin proved too slippery to climb out. Most of the fossils of these young, of those were young adult males, the counterparts of human teenagers. Based on comparisons with their social structure of African elephants, to whom they are distantly related, biologists say that young males were probably driven from their herds, that naivete led them to what eventually became their mausoleum. Young adult females stayed with the herd. Juveniles and infants stayed with their mothers. And adult males were too experienced to venture into risky sinkholes. I can almost sense the herds along Blood Brook, roaming, feeding, socializing at the dawn of human history. Their enormous mammals must have been a powerful force in the evolution of plants upon which they fed. The press of history can still be detected in some of these plants. And I'm going to pause for a moment. And um, you all know what, what hawthorns are? You know the big thorns? Who do you think those thorns evolved to, to um, not to graze on? They're way too big for deer and the space too far apart. If you look at a hawthorn, all the top branches, 20 or 30 feet in the air, have thorns. No deer I know can climb a tree. These are what's called ghosts of evolution. They're evidence of a plant evolving to discourage a uh, primary grazer that no longer is with us. In many cases, those grazers were ground sloths. There's no evidence ground sloths were in Vermont. They certainly were in Ohio, in Indiana, and in Western Pennsylvania. But clearly, it's discouraging something that's no longer with us to feed. Paleontologists believe that the giant ground sloth, an extinct ice age behemoth, sat upright and pulled branches into its mouth exerted such an enormous pressure on incipient desert vegetation that ocotillo thorns and cactus spines developed a self-defense. These adaptations persist. The sloths have been extinct for more than 6,000 years. Pawpaw, a hardwood from the southern Appalachian floodplains, produces a five-inch cylindrical fruit that suggests a banana. After feeding the brownish fruit to several woodland omnivores, a raccoon and a possum, I believe, as well as to an elephant, a biologist discovered that pawpaw seeds germinated best in the manure pile that the elephants supplied. Then, gazing into evolution's crystal ball, he speculated that pawpaw, the lone member of a tropical family of plants, to have immigrated into the temperate zone, evolved its large sugary fruit to entice mastodons to disperse its seeds. Where are the evolutionary footprints to be found in the Northeast? My vision is not sensitive enough to see the mark mammoths and mastodons left on Bloodbrook's vegetation, but I may have found them roaming in the outback of a Western Abnaki myth. Can these giants have survived in Paleolithic stories, their images indelibly painted in the mind, sharp and bright as those rendered on the walls in the caves of France? Could stories have been passed down through the centuries via, an Abnaki, <coughs> via what Abnaki author Joseph Bruchak calls the long memory? Into the age of woodland Indians, a journey of some 8,000 years? In one story, a mound-shaped beast with two long teeth drank the people's springs and lakes and squashed the scouts until a snowy owl tricked them into falling over, then shot them in the soles of the feet with ivory arrowheads sprung from an ivory bow. That American mastodons and woolly mammoths survived on the fringe of recorded history, brushing against the very species of trees which populate Bloodbrook Valley, thrills me. They likely knew the lilt of the brook 
and the song of the chickadee, the drumming of the grouse. And likely, too, I've walked where they've walked, sat where they sat, peed where they peed, and breathed the same cool air that once filled their enormous lungs. So I am good for taking questions if anybody has any questions. Yeah, I'm wondering, the, the topology that we have today, was that sort of made afresh with each coming and going of, of the ice? It was, it was or, ground. Imagine using a belt sander right. on a piece of wood. That's what the glaciers did. So every time the glaciers left, they left behind a different topology then? Yes, the ground and smooth. There's a, there's a um, glacial erratic boulder train starting on the south east end of, of Mount Scutney that goes almost all the way to Dublin. Um, you know, I might add, I, I grew up in suburban Long Island, like many of you may know. Um, but I like to think I grew up in disjunct New England because Long Island is nothing more than New England ground rock. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, Probably. It would just because it's. Hard. That's my that's my uneducated guess. Okay. Is that it'll get out competed. But if those birds somehow weren't there, would it somehow? Don't know. You don't know. No, but I do know it's it's leaving the Catskills, mm -hmm. and it's you know it's going to step by step all the way up to Newfoundland. Um, it's going to be affect, be affected by climate change. Things that you know, I mean, as far as I can tell, there's going to be winners and losers. And that happens, you know, 99% of all living things have become extinct mm -hmm. over the course of 4 billion years. So it's, it shouldn't come as a shock, it's just that we're seeing it. Mm -hmm. um, if, you know, this whole thing has been sped up, sadly. But um, there clearly will be winners. I mean, there be, maybe, maybe there's a bird like a chickadee that will radiate into 30 different species, like an ancestral warbler might have done a million or two million years ago. Yeah. You talked about um, a lot of the birds moving to the north because their climate is changing. What what takes up their space as they things move? coming from the south? Moving but there. is there a space? Like, do they like just have a broader region? Those southern birds? Like, uh, it, de moving? it depends what's happening where they live. Yeah. I mean, since I moved up here in 1975, since I moved here. I can tell you unequivocally, cardinals have come, titmice have come, red-bellied woodpeckers, really recently, um, blue-gray gnatcatchers, um, blue-winged and golden-winged warblers are starting to come up the Connecticut Valley and get reported with some regularity. But down there at the equator, is something happening? <laughs> like, is there some, are there other creatures that are filling in those gaps that they're leaving? Well, or are they, they could, too hot to even, it, it, it depends. I mean, they could have a very long range. Yeah. I mean, sugar maples range from northern Florida into southern Canada. Mm -hmm. And um, black-capped chickadees have a kind of a range just pretty much like that. Uh, you know, who knows what's going to happen on the southern end of the yeah, range, but they're clearly going to keep moving north. Yeah. And boreal chickadees will be hard-pressed to stay because their habitat is going to disappear, is disappearing. And possums have come up since I've lived here. Yeah. I mean, I can remember when I'd stop the car and look at a roadkill possum, which I don't do that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Brian? I was just mentioned that when I first came here 28 years ago, I, I came from Connecticut, where I learned about Lyme disease. And when I first got here, Lyme disease didn't exist in, in, uh, in Connecticut. And now we see it all. Right. Well, you know, in the 80s, uh, I had a dog, and I bet I didn't remove more than two ticks a year from that dog, and they were always dog ticks. They were never black-legged ticks. And now babesiosis is getting fairly common. Yeah? Uh, in answer to this person's question, there is a little bit of evidence that at the equator, as things warm up, nothing is replacing them ecologically, if you go far enough. 
Thanks, Tom. Um, I had a question about uh, unbogus. I don't know if it gets this far north, but it, it has incredible thorns low down in the plant, not up in the tree. So it's, again, probably selected by grass or something that would come up from the ground. Yeah, I don't know. I don't think I've ever seen honey locusts here. Black locusts, I see. It doesn't be quite this far north. Yeah, Osage orange is another one with a fruit that somebody else used to disperse its seeds. Yeah. Okay, what about an invasive species that we have around here, the buckthorn? It has the long thorns that seem to be in on the trunk or higher up. Could they have the same phenomenon? I would assume that it's a, it's a native to Europe. So I assume something was grazing on it in Europe and that was an adaptation to the scourge of grazing. Yeah. So, Ted, nice to see you. Say again? I said, nice to see you. Yes, good to see you. So, I live by um, Trout's Pond, about a half a mile, but in that kind of valley area. And when I, you know, initially put a garden in in the mid 80s, there was so much clay in the soil there. But, so, but my vision was that maybe it was kind of along the clay pitch What was the other lake that you said? Yeah, clay is usually a, a um, sediment that s settles down in lakes. In lakes. Yeah, so not in rivers, not in moving water. So from the bottom of those lakes? Is Could be, yeah. yeah. Those are barbed clays in that area. I've seen them. Yeah, yeah. there's some in, in, by the Esther in Hanover. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is it, can you speak a little bit about the difference between the Adirondack Mountains and here in terms of why, why it's so different? The Adir difference between the, Adir between, the Adirondacks between, and... Like the, you know, the Connecticut River Valley and the Adirondack Mountains seems like very, very different terrain. Well, <coughs> it, it, it is. We're lower down. They're higher up. They're further north. And they're, they're literally a gigantic block of granite, about 5,000 square miles. Um, yeah, there's a lot of similarities. But you know, the, the Hudson is probably the biggest river in the Adirondacks. And that just gets started up there. So it's nothing like the Connecticut is here. You know, more than that, I can't offer much. Yeah, I was thinking, I, think I was thinking, too, but, you know, I see whether there was something well, I think a lot of the, a lot of similar things would have happened in northern Maine, northern New Hampshire, northern Vermont. You know, as you get out to the Midwest, Ohio, western Pennsylvania, Indiana, there'd be a lot of differences because they don't have the uplift that we have. Well, thank you all for that time. Just one more comment, one question. The Adirondacks are fundamentally different geologically. Not part of the evolution. They're part of the, uh, the northern shield. So geologically, they're much older, and here they're just from the evolution. No. They're granite, right? They're a mosaic. Yeah. Granite, limestone, and they're very complex geologically. Um, my, my question is carrion feeding birds, such as are so well documented in the western United States and where the Are there any? Yeah, there were a lot of mammal. Yeah, yeah, I have so never found the other birds. Any no no evidence from the fossil. But you know that, that's another bird. I found a, a turkey vulture nest in Boston Lot in 1980, and that was the first officially documented turkey vulture nest in New Hampshire or Vermont. And now we've got black vultures that are likely nesting in Maine. Um, I, Ted. Are you happy to stick around for a little while for those who want to continue to? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Would you join me?